Happy. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the third episode of uh, Open Source in Business, which is a speaker series uh, of conversations with industry experts with a very wide lens on the role of open source and uh, the role that it plays in uh, the industry at large. Uh, I'm Dave Neary, and today I'm joined by Dirk Rila, who is a, a researcher with the University of Erlangen in, in Berlin. He's a professor of open source, and he has a, a particular focus on the business of open source having a decade in industry in addition to academia. And I'm also joined by Alyssa Wright, who's the head of community and partner development at the Open Source Collective, which is a nonprofit focused on providing fiscal sponsorship uh, to open source projects and currently manages over 200 projects. 2000. 2000, apologies, order of magnitude or um, undersold you there. Uh, so um, today's topic is the um, labor economics, the open, sor open source labor. And it's been one of my favorite catchphrases is the most popular business model in open source is get a job um, because it's the way that most people who work on open source make a living. Um, Dirk, you've been researching this topic for a number of years, and I'd love to know what what do you see is the labor labor market of open source software developers like right now? <laughs> Hi, Dave. Uh, so thanks a lot for for having me on your fabulous uh, uh, podcast. Yeah. Um, so to your question, uh, the labor market is definitely getting better, meaning employers increasingly understand the value of open source. And we are talking not about the usual suspect, the usual companies you're talking about, but lots of other companies which are not in the first row, but rather are often selling products that aren't even software. Yeah. So from the automotive, from other industries, they all understand the value of open source in their products, whatever they are. And so they are hiring definitely uh, for open source capabilities and competence or they use open source as a measuring stick of how good a developer is. So definitely uh, being an open source developer is helpful for finding a job in, in software engineering and software development. Um, is there any, you've mentioned a lot of industry sectors there and some non-IT companies. Um, so it seems to me that there's a very wide range of areas where people are hiring open source developers. How do you pick the promising projects to work on that will showcase your skills um, in a way that will maximize your opportunity of getting a job. Oh, all right. So you're already making the assumption that in order to get a job, uh, like having open source on your resume is beneficial. And I agree, but you actually have to view this in kind of stages. There are different things that give you more value, if you will. And that's perhaps how you should look at it if you are that totally rational, focused uh, person on your career. So saying that, first of all, you will be best off if you actually find projects that you enjoy and love. So that, that will definitely make your life um, better. And I'm saying that because this entirely rational perspective is helpful, but obviously only part of it. So um, what does open source give you? So we know uh, that uh, hiring managers, engineering managers, at least definitely look at your resume and ask where is the GitLab, GitLab uh, uh, link to some open source project you worked on. So the basic demonstration of your engineering skills in an open source project is already valuable simply because you can't show code from your old old employer, right? That's proprietary. So if you have worked in open source, you're just demonstrating uh, basic skills. But it goes beyond that because um, as you work in an open source project, you're also demonstrating social skills. Uh, you won't, I think, it's not really even a dirty secret. Like everyone knows you uh, want to have nice co-workers. So the ability to work in a team uh, as demonstrated, for example, from going to from going to be just a contributor to a core team member of some open source project is already that shows an employer and future colleagues, you're a person one can work with, right? So there's an increasing um, certification of sorts of your ability as you engage in open source and more deeply engage. Um, you're also asking how to identify the best project. That is actually getting hard because um, 
uh, you can be very entrepreneurial and then maybe you pick the right project that a couple of years from now will be super hot and you will be totally in demand. The problem is you can't, can't predict the future. So you can follow trends. Uh, you can look at data or so, but I think guts and community you are in will better help you. Now, you can actually turn it around. You can actually look for employers and IT is pretty good, meaning you can actually to some extent choose employers with the request to be working on open source projects uh, that are of relevance to the employer. So maybe they let you and that is your entry to a career in open source in parallel to what you're doing for the employer. Okay. And then you have your foot in the door. And uh, yeah, it's a nice idea. Yeah. But it's uh, so what, something you said caught my attention, and I'd be interested to get both of your perspectives on this. Is that um, it occurs to me that the ability to get a lot of open source experience assumes a certain level of, for want of a better word, privilege. Um, that there's a, you know, there's a certain bar to um, participating uh, voluntarily in open source projects. Um, in the context of increasing diversity in the computer industry and you know making making sure that we're maximizing the talent that we bring into this industry uh, by identifying people who don't have maybe that privilege um what kind of what kind of opportunities exist for people who you know maybe don't have the same access to technology or um uh, who don't have the same you know for want of a better work, uh, expression, temporal liberty, the, the free time to spend working on, on open source projects. How can we, how can we address that problem? Alyssa, do you want <laughs> I, I, to? Yeah, it, sure. It, I would love kind of a, one of those questions that's um, a little bit tricky. Yeah, tricky is, is one word for it. It's, I think it's a really difficult uh, question and and something that I think many of us. Um, in open source and, and definitely within like the open source collective um, uh, endeavor is 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 trying to is trying to understand and address. Um, so you know, first of all, I also want to thank uh, everybody here. It's it's really a pleasure to be able to like speak about I think such kind of relevant um, questions and, and issues, and they are truly you know part of my own like explorations. And uh, for, for us, Open Source Collective is, is designed to um, allow people that are um, responsible for open source projects, that are building open source projects, that are part of open source communities and ecosystems, that they are able to um, make a living um, w in that commitment. And that, that living, um, you know, quote unquote, that might be, um, uh, within a business structure, like like we were just talking about, and and working for you know a company that allows them to participate in open source communities, or or really can or can be um, you know independent and outside of a business like um, entity and framework, and and I think it's important to you know even in the conversation about diversity, re recognize that um, what contribution looks like, what um, self-sufficiency su looks like, you know, is, is varied um, across all of us. And and then when it comes to um, being able, so I bring this up because we very much see um, the kind of like model of open source uh, collective of being able to support like one's open source um, providing fiscal structure to support open source development is an equity issue. Like is about building resiliency in the open source community, and um, and this is as much for you know the um, college graduate who is working on an open source project um, in their free time while they might be working um, at a company uh, to um, uh, open source developers in marginalized communities in like sub-Saharan Africa, and it's um, it, and I think from my from my perspective to answer that question specifically. Um, I think that I think that um, uh, allowing people to be part of open source like innovation and development and um, and health from from many different types of, of contribution um, and sometimes that contribution might be um, with the privilege of being able to do development um, 
you know, because, because of a, well, because they have a good uh, Wi-Fi connection because um, they have extra time because they maybe don't have family commitments. But I, I also think there's a lot of uh, value in having people like share their experiences, uh, you, uh, of using, um, sorry, using an open source project, like maybe in their day to day or um, in exploration and so like um, in even as user testers, you know, and like in different types of capacity and expertise. Um, so I guess to answer the question, diversifying what community looks like, I think is a way to allow for diversity of, of, um, of participation. I hope that made some sense. Brilliant. I know we got to a lot yeah. of this. Yeah. That was, that was brilliant. Uh, by the way, the fall colors in North Carolina look beautiful behind you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah. yeah I'm, 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 working working on some of the non mm -hmm. I'm sorry, Dirk. I, yeah, I, I, work add, some of the non yeah, I want to tell <laughs> that some barriers really have come down uh, thanks to open source. So, well, basic tech, technical access has made it possible to actually. Uh, read into open source, so much more is documented, so much more of current infrastructure is open source. Compare that with the old days where it was proprietary technology, where maybe you had to pay expensive seminars just to be able to use, uh, use a particular proprietary piece of software. So many, not all, clearly not all, but many barriers have come down through uh, um, internet access and the openness around open source projects just in terms of documentation, being able to use it, being able to provide services and that way to get into the uh, labor market. Definitely, there are many more barriers that need to come down from uh, from uh, uh, cultural aspects, um, social aspects, cultural aspects, other diversity aspects. But we see that those also sometimes have not been as bad as we assumed. So for a while, for example, we thought, oh, China is not contributing to open source at all. You can measure some of that in our research we did as people are contributing. You can count the commits basically to code repositories and see where they are coming from. But China now is developing a thriving, thriving uh, own uh, open source uh, ecosystem. And clearly what we thought was wrong at the time, which is that collaboration values in different cultures might prevent, uh, might prevent contribution to open source. So working hypothesis of many academics was the collaboration values of open source are so Western, maybe Eastern more countries would not easily pick up for that. And it's clearly not the case. So maybe it's more like developers is the, uh, is the actual dimension how to look at people. Yeah, yeah I, I, I appreciate that perspective. And I think it's worth also calling out that there are you know, a number of great nonprofit initiatives out there that are trying to bring um, digital literacy and uh, developer skills earlier in the education cycle, things like Scratch, um, uh, coder dojos, uh, things like that, that are that are initiatives like the R of Code that are that are trying to create a sort of a movement to uh, increase computer literacy in school. Um, and I think that it's also worth calling out some of the initiatives like Black Girls Code or um, uh, you know other initiatives that are that are specifically targeting underrepresented uh, communities. So I think I, I but I appreciate the point that um, open source is actually rather than raising barriers has removed some of the barriers that used to exist and now we're just noticing other barriers right which is good it's progress mm -hmm. but we're we're still not where we want to be um Alyssa, uh, so for a lot of developers the goal is not just to get paid to work on a project any project i don't care they want to work on the project that they care about the project that they're developing or maintaining and and i think um you know your organization uh, is is one of the examples of the ways in which developers are now kind of brainstorming with models like Patreon uh, to figure out how to get paid for the project that they work on in a sustainable way. Um, do you have some perspectives on on like what kind of advice do you give to an open source developer uh, when they're at that point where they decide, you know, I want to try and make money from from this work that I'm doing? Again, I, I, actually, a really good question as well. Um, because I think we all recognize that it's 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 um, it's sometimes hard 
to surface like the value to put a, a financial you know uh, price tag on the value of, of open source contribution we know that it's um kind of underpins like so much of our you know technical technical lives um and the development of 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 work but you know how do we articulate like the the value and the value that you're um you um that that you, that 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 you're worth, and so one of the major things um, that I think also uh, research uh, from uh, Carnegie Mellon uh, supports is that part of um, part of what we recommend is that people ask uh, to be paid. Do you know that you know we often do if they are looking to find a sustainable avenues to support their um, their project, their work. Um, one of the like most significant uh, uh, movements towards that is, is asking and asking. You know, perhaps with like you know real specificity about you know what your what that contribution um, will go to, the impact that it will make. Um, you know, some sometimes you just don't know that uh, people are looking for support, um, and so. Uh, we encourage like open source um, projects um, to to ask, and that's what the platform is kind of designed to do um, as well, or at least support um, with providing you know um, avenues for kind of outlining a budget and 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 goal uh, you know aims towards that budget. Um, I think another thing that um, projects can do is um, you know we've we've discussed how it's not. I think with open source, you're you're not um, selling your the the code like the development. You're actually like what's valuable um, for a project is is your time, and um, and that is something that um, is you know is also worth um, uh, or I would encourage like um, developers to kind of trying to figure out what, what's the, the price tag on that, you know, talking to and providing to potential um, funders, what the roadmap looks like, what um, might be, you know, upcoming, you know, um, breaks and in, in, in updates, um, uh, responding and providing training for, for teams, um, working with, with developers and responding to, you know, bugs like this, this is the time that investment that I think helps to translate um, to being uh, financially like backed and sustained as well. So do you recommend more uh, a kind of a model of identifying a smaller number of people who will pay for hours, like consulting hours, uh, providing an SLA for response time, that kind of thing, getting a retainer type model? Or do you advocate more the um, wide based uh, but shallow uh, like subscription model, uh, you know, ten dollars a month to support the project. You know, it's funny. I think. I mean, I think both can be successful, and I probably, um, uh, you know, the answer lies in the nature of the project. But I, I think, you know, me, me personally, and what I try to um, support within Open Source Collective, and even my, you know, previous roles in open source um, space, is the former. Like, I think that there's a lot um, with a, you know, that's that's available in a support contract um, in, you know, a, added on consulting hours in training um, and, and encourage, encouraging that the, the, the pot, like the community of people that are supporting and sustaining the project is not just yourself, but also like a, you know, a collective of people. And so um, uh, I think that, you know, sustaining the projects is, is, is like a kind of a, a, a Me mechanism for sustaining yourself as well. Okay, I, I do think that that like there's a starting point, which is that if your project is not providing sufficient value to people, if you don't have like a big enough user base or uh, people who are relying on your project for some kind of commercial activity, you're going to have a very hard time selling, you know, any either of those models, either the subscription model or the or the the bigger model. Would you agree right. with that? Yeah, I would. And I think that um, I, I think, Dirk, you had brought up like the importance of like the social aspect of um, open source and, and its value when um, uh, being considered by by, um, you know, company, you know, uh, being brought in by a company. I think that um, it's also really important to kind of look at and emphasize the the relationships that you build. Um, 
uh, that I think it's just as important as like the development that you're building as well. So attending events that may be hosted by people that you think are, um, uh, are, are could find value in your work, um, looking at their projects um, and being engaged with them. So the, you know, at a minimum you're building trust. Um, I look at, you know, anything that comes in as a bug, you know, you're responding to. Um, and I, I think that 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 type of of um, of kind of re review or, you know, prioritization, you know, even in the most informal ways, I think would be um, valuable in, in kind of further further developing like the importance of uh, and value of the work um, to to, uh, you know, a potential backer. I think also what's interesting about that is you learn um, as a developer what people are interested in, um, what what is most important because you know you you don't you you can't you, you it's it's almost like an informal like um, user research um, and so I think that that's like seeing that as not like something extra that you um, that takes you away from the development but rather um, something that really adds to. The, the quality of what you're building um, is 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 also like an important part, I think, to, to building um, and establishing value of your project. It's an interesting point that um, harkens back to episode one of this series, which was open source product management, um, and where we had product managers talking about the open source project as being an ideal place to do field research on user needs and 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 capture requirements. It's a, so thank you for bringing that up. <laughs> it, it it allows me to. Uh, to pimp another episode. Um, I kind of jump in there with a comment. I think there are basically three, three different forms of how you can stay with your favorite open source project. The first one we talked about in the beginning, which is get hired uh, by someone to work on that project because it's important to that employer. Once you achieve that, it's not easy to get there, but once you are working on an open source project of commercial relevance, that is, a community project, meaning it's not owned by your employer in some way, uh, you're actually in a good position because you get this additional free agency in addition to just being an employer an employee because other companies will also be uh, very much interested in hiring you if it's Kubernetes or something that is just very uh, relevant. So you can find an employer if you're involved with uh, with a high profile or even medium profile relevant open source project. The second one you talk, touched on only shortly or Alyssa talk, touched on when talking about labor, meaning you can run your, if you want to be independent, so not get hired, but really remain independent. You can be a freelancer and consultant, but then as you implied, you mostly will be selling your time to do custom development of which you hope then, not guaranteed, but hope it goes back into the project, right? But the interesting thing is, and I really want, think it's helpful to make this a third separate step is turning your enthusiasm for an open source project into a product company uh, for that open source uh, project, which is different from just consulting. So meaning now you're trying to do a product and selling a product, um, uh, whether that's Red Hat Enterprise Linux or so, it's just very different from, from uh, being paid for your time. The product could be, could start out with a retainer relationship where you're kind of giving insurance or selling insurance all the way to packaging it and building on the open source project for some commercial product or service. But that, I find it hard there, there, are, there is a possibility that you stay small and are comfortable, but if the project is really important, the open source project is really important, there will just be a strong pull to grow or other people will do it. So that it's really hard to have a sweet spot of you, yourself, or you and a small crew enjoying life with your own small company. Um, so this, this, this uh, beyond freelancing, then there's the scaling up startup and in between that's hard. Uh, I don't, that sweet spot is not hard, is hard to be in long-term and be happy. I would I really like to... the rest of our time talking about business, starting up a business around a, a kind of a, a small boutique business around a company. But before that, I do want to go to, we have a couple of questions. Uh, on Can the I just clarify one point? Yes. Um, 
when it comes to like uh, looking at the value of time, I, I didn't mean to imply that that's about consulting. Um, that uh, the the I, I think like time can be support, time can be the retainer, time can be like sharing the the roadmap um, or or you know first insight into the roadmap. Like um, time time is what as opposed to the code base time is is really what uh you know we see as like kind of a an avenue for sustainability hmm. but yes the let's hit the questions yeah exactly it's the rare resource um so we have a couple of questions that i think are interesting one from uh, deborah bryant uh, what is the most recent academic work that has been published in the area of diversity especially in demographics of contributor communities and Dirk, do you have any insights into <clears throat> the, the, the keyword academic probably points to me. Uh, I'm thinking about it. Um, unfortunately, I honestly don't don't know uh, what what's uh, going on specifically in diversity research and open source, implying it's probably necessary to have much more. OK, sorry, Deborah. And uh... A question from Josh. Uh, so a decade ago, there were some interesting attempts. And I'm not sure. Um, sorry, uh, the question was not on diversity, but in general, uh, the demographics of open source contributor communities. Uh, oh, so um, I've the general trend in the data that we see is indeed what I said earlier, a pickup of open source all around the world. Um, for me, the big one was that China is finally catching up. I've traveled over the years many, many times. And only 10 years ago, the government tried to kicking and screaming, uh, get companies, paid companies to do open source. And what didn't work 10 years ago is working really well today. So. Um, beyond Western cultures, I do see that there's clearly a diversity along that dimension around the world. Among more uh, other social dimensions, again, I'm not so sure. Okay. Uh, so uh, from, from, my, from my research and learning, like something that's always been really interesting to me is that often um, open source, and this is uh, historically, open source actually doesn't do as well as proprietary software in terms of uh, diversity, or at least in, in, when it comes to gender representation. Um, and I think there was a study again of Wikipedia back in like you know 2010 or something where 2.5% of contributors were were female. And you know there's been I think a an industry wide um, re, you know, Reflection on on why that is and what that means, and um, you know, I I come specifically from the OpenStreetMap community where we also had many struggles with diversity. Even though you know it's a it's a global map, I mean, there should be people from all over the world uh, contributing, and yet um, it was a very um, a, like you know had kind of select demographic of of who was participating, and um, uh, we have seen, and I think kind of seen in other communities that there there has been change i think that there's um an acknowledgement that like there's many different types of of expertise that is needed in an open source community including like maybe perhaps a person who's going to write the business plan for a startup um that there is um, many different perspectives that need to be um like brought in to have like a successful project and that you know fundamentally like like i think we've seen in technology work Fundamentally, is that having diversity in the room as you're creating something um, makes makes for a better like uh, project and solution. And so, I am very hopeful about like the diversity of open source. And when we look at the open source projects that we're supporting at Open Source Collective, they do reflect a diversity of um, of of people. And it's important for us also that the governance of how we work um, and the governance of the projects uh, that we we support um, uh, take that into consideration and, and for ex example our board um, we, we really try to uh, make sure that we have re representation from like uh, under underserved and marginalized communities so 
Um, I think that there's a lot that we're doing around um, diversity and a lot we need to continue to do. But uh, again, it's a space that I'm I'm hopeful um, for and then, um, so. Great. Yes. So, go so you, mentioned, you mentioned writing business plans there. Uh, so that was actually kind of leading into uh, the next topic, going, getting back to if you want, if you're working on an open source project and you want to figure out how to make a business out of it, like a small business, a startup, um, and not a, a venture funded startup, but this is something that will keep you and maybe a few other people um, employed. Um, what kind of things do you have to think about? going into a business plan um, for something like that. Dirk, do you want to have a, a first go at this? Sure. Um, so uh, the, the, it's the Silicon Valley style definition, but the, the, it's still a general one for a startup is uh, some organization in search of a working business model. So. Um, uh, you don't know what you will be earning your money with from yet. So you need to figure that out. And that's how you should structure your activities, learning what creates value for your, for your potential customers. It's obviously not the source code itself. Um, if it's open source, um, I think, um, you are, we are also, I think this is an important distinction to make. We are obviously talking about community open source where the, copyright is shared broadly. That's the type of project we're talking about because everything else, if some company owns the copyright, we're off to a venture funded scale up, uh, wants to be a unicorn type of startup. So you're asking about its community. Uh, um, then we are back to uh, retainer models. That's the obvious one for a freelancer uh, to start with. If it's a widely used software that has its users, whatever, Blender or so, and you uh, have companies that are your customers for that. Find out what they care about. Is it additional features? Is it the insurance to uh, be able to call someone late at night because something's not working? Uh, what are the features for that? The interesting thing is all the features that companies care about as your customers, they are well known. Just look to a regular classic proprietary vendor, they the, the, what they know is what customers want. So look whether you can recreate that in open source and explore that. Does that work for your potential customer base? Alyssa, what would, what would your advice be on kind of business plan 101 for, a, for an open source software developer who's like just getting started? Yeah. <clears throat> Again, I mean, I don't want to underestimate. Like this, that's a hard. It's a hard thing to do, um, and and it's it's and it's not insurmountable. I mean, and we're all doing, I suppose, like hard things. But um, um, you know, uh, give, give yourself some some kindness uh, when putting together one's first business plan. Um, I, I I we've said it a, a couple times, and I, I think that this is such an important concept of like of of thinking about value, like what is um, the value of your work? What is the value of your team? What is the value of your perspective um, for for uh, the ecosystem um, and for the you know the 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 companies uh, entities that might be um, your your financial you know uh, uh, base? So. Um, Anything that you can do, um, either on your own or, or in partnership, of um, trying to uh, both identify and and put a financial value on on that value, I, I think is really important. Um, and the, like Dirk was saying, I mean, a lot of that might already be you know uh, public um, and um, and you know easily accessible. Like once once going to the, the right places, I think. Um, what, what companies can do in partnership is is help. Uh, I'm really always interested in, in companies um, also being aware of the value of the open source in, in their work, um, in their supply chains. Um, that I think that it will be really important information in trying to kind of construct a, a business plan. And then um, and then the value of the entire like you know larger ecosystem that you fit into. Like what what is this, you know, your one project in, you know, in maybe you're, 
maybe you're it's applicable in like you know self-driving cars like what does that quote market look like you know in, in five ten years I, I think seeing the 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 seeing and articulating and putting like real like quantified informed you know research numbers um and and examples um for for the the value of your work um I, I think is is kind of like a starting point for building any sort of business model and and you know it's not just a business model i think it's also your product roadmap you know this is this is really like useful information for your own sort of um creation and development process so, i think one, yeah. of, one of the key points for me is to realize that your product may be something completely independent of the project um mm. you know when we were discussing this in prep one of the things i said is that what you may be able to sell might not be what you'd like to do right if you're a developing a javascript framework what you may be able to sell is developing web pages using that javascript framework rather than you know, getting people to pay you to maintain the JavaScript framework. And there are a few examples that come to mind uh, in that um, vein, you know, the, the Drupal, for example, has this awesome uh, commercial community of people who are all collaboratively maintaining Drupal, but the main business model around Drupal is, is developing and deploying Drupal-based websites. Mm. Um, uh, Basecamp uh, is another example of a project where, you know, you've got this awesome uh, open source community around Ruby on Rails, but the product that the company created is 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 Basecamp as a software as a service, mm -hmm. and so I think it's uh, it's important to to kind of think about the fact that maybe what you will be able to sell is not what you would like to be doing with all of your time. But I think connecting it to the the quality of what you sell is connected to the the quality of this underlying framework and 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 and. Uh, pricing your work uh, to to make sure that you can like continue to maintain like this like shared uh, open source project. Do yeah. So I'm looking at my laundry list of what software vendors kind of um, sell, and so I think you touched on most of the things. Still, it's worth mentioning that additional functionality, even though it smells like open core, is sometimes just acceptable you have something in addition to the open source software that you're just selling as software documentation and training materials uh, are also equally relevant and intellectual property you can sell access to self-help services forums mailing lists etc uh, more classic guarantees fitness for use or certification that already sounds like a larger company, but if you can take the software and certify it for some particular environment, uh, say some particular uh, hardware, that would be valuable um, uh, to, to potential customers. Then the usual support hotline uh, or on-site servicing you can do. You mentioned consulting, um, uh, in-house training, well, actually operations, yeah, that's the big one. Uh, you operate the software for someone in your cloud that makes life much easier for customers. Yeah. With that, um, looking at it from a business model perspective, so we talked about the value proposition of the classic Silicon Valley business model canvas. Uh, in addition, there are other aspects to a good uh, business model, which is, for example, what resources do you have? And that brings us back to the original labor market question, which is, are you a committer? Are you a core developer? Or are you just a small time contributor? So your position in an open source project determines the price you can ask for, so for example, for your services. And so that is actually really hard economics. <laughs> you may not always like it, but I really like Alyssa saying, like, think hard about the financial value and don't give it away for free. Um, thank you. And um, there was a Can talk. I also? Yeah, far ahead. Far ahead. Um, yeah. I mean, I, 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 you know, I think, um, I think in many respects, we all empathize with like the, this challenge bec um, and um, because it's, it's, it's hard, I, I think, for us to find um, uh, the business model for the open source projects that we that we care about, and I one of the reasons why I've been a part of open source work, you know, since the the very beginning is that there are resources all around you, um, and and people that like either you know like Dirk researches this space, or we 
contribute to our own communities. And and so I I feel like um, nobody who's um, doing this needs to do it alone. Um, and um, and that uh, I I hope that yeah uh, that is I, I think one of the strengths of of this space is that like you know build a business model try try your best but there are so many other people that can help you along the way. Yeah, I think the the network is um, is super important and it's kind of the the key point that open source gives you is that public access. Um, to to a network of professional uh, professional network, um, I wonder have either of you seen successful examples of because one of those one of those places where open source dominates is system libraries, uh, developer frameworks. Have you seen any successful examples of smaller um, smaller companies bootstrapping through uh, partnerships, working with bigger companies that are providing solutions based on that framework? Um, I'm I'm wondering if working with system integrators is a is a is a successful potential avenue. Well, we've seen a lot of collectives um, like quite successful in in building a budget to support like a small team. And and what's you know unique is that they haven't like necessarily like they incorporated as like a, a business, but rather um, as like a collective. And we provide like the fiscal you know infrastructure. Um, so, um, Babel, ESLint, Webpack, I think are all examples of where they've been able to, um, uh, build a budget, build partnerships with larger contributors. I think also what's, you know, equally important, build partnerships with smaller contributors. Um, and so with like kind of collective support, um, continue to grow, grow their work. Um, and, and that is kind of, again, our goal or one of our goals with Open Source Collective is that we are able to see more and more projects do that. Thank you. Um, so to wrap up our conversation, I'm gonna go back to uh, Q&A. It was a little bit orthogonal to the discussion, so I left it until the end. Um, Josh asks, a decade ago, there were some interesting attempts to expand open source organizing principles to other industries, such as the movie post-production sector. These, in, these initiatives seem to have largely gone away um, do you think that open source principles will remain limited to the tech workforce? And I'm not sure exactly what Josh means by open source principles, but I guess, you know, collaborative princi principles, um, uh, working across silos, uh, working transparently, those kind of things. Josh, if you have any, if you have any precisions you'd like to ask, offer, um, pipe up in chat and I will invite you on screen. So... Uh Shall we answer to that? <laughs> Are you yeah. waiting for Josh? Yeah. Yeah, but I think um, he added a little bit of, of um, clarification where it also includes um, collective ownership um, of work between companies. Um, yeah, it, it, I have my opinion of, yeah. Yeah. I mean, so they're classic cooperative. They wouldn't use uh, open source principles, but across all industries, they're cooperatives. I think what is um, important is that they are just lagging. So you can argue open source, open source style collaboration gave us open data, gave us wikis, gave us Wikipedia, is giving us open hardware, is giving us open access. Uh, so it's making its way as a way of collaboration independent of just software into all, all other industries. Now, uh, all other types of activities. Now, talking about industries, the uh, the movie post production. I'm not sure whether that was a specific reference to the movie industry joining forces to develop open source software, because that is a really interesting topic. That we now have companies which are not software vendors sponsoring the development of open source software for their need to basically get rid of vendor lock-in from commercial products that they've depended on so far. So that is an important topic because the IT industry is large, but the rest of the industry is even larger than the IT industry. And once they get their understanding of uh, how to do collaborative software development, sponsor it, uh, we'll be looking at a whole new world in software. You're on mute, uh, Alyssa. 
I'm trying to unmute you. <laughs> no, can't. It's on your side. So I see something about blenders. Oops, she's gone. Oh, well, just uh, something yeah. on Blender. I definitely have a student uh, who is a very happy Blender supporter and follows the retainer model and is surviving. Yeah, so okay. it's not entirely that. <laughs> I'm a big fan of that project. Mm -hmm. uh, I will say, um, in addition, that um, we're increasingly seeing, but it does seem to be limited to software initiatives. We're increasingly seeing uh, initiatives in new industry verticals that are coming to open source and collabor collaboration for you know, shared heavy lifting on uh, what these industries would like to be commodity shared infrastructure projects. Um, some examples are uh, the network functions virtualization movement in telecommunications, running 5G on open source software, um, healthcare, finance, uh, even resource um, uh, resource extraction, the, the oil and gas industry are sharing on these common, are, are collaborating on these common software platforms mm -hmm. to provide access to data. So data interoperability, file format interoperability, and access through common interfaces that are implemented in open source are all very much industry trends across, across mm -hmm. a number of verticals, um, which I think is an interesting development. Um, yeah. It seems like Alyssa has lost the network. I'm, I, I would like to wait for her to rejoin to, um, uh, to, to thank you both for for this uh, conversation, I would I would like to um, uh, give you the final word, uh, Dirk, on on what you in addition to everything that we've discussed. Um, do you have any additional insight on the labor economics around open source? Mm -hmm. um, so going back to that original question, I can only. Uh, tell you what I tell my students basically is that they should get their hands wet in open source because it has the, the full range of opportunities that it affords them from the basic GitHub link on their profile that lets some employer uh, check what they did, which reduces the hiring risk to an employer to get started in industry. Uh, all the way to gaining additional personal freedom and free agency uh, by being involved in relevant open source projects that simply make it easier to, to switch employers if you're if you're not happy. So um, it's absolutely a fabulous work uh, uh, world out there for our uh, for our, um, our students or anyone in IT. Um, the topic that we had at the end is also really important because um, we counted at some point of time the number of foundations that sprung up from um, industries that are not the software industries. So we're talking education, automotive, always automotive, but also completely non non IT like libraries forming foundations to develop the software they need. So that is a big trend. What that means for vendors and the enormous amounts of money being made in the IT industry remains to be seen, but maybe the rest of the world is uh, asking for some of its money back or independence back, which might be a good thing given the uh, significance of- And we do plan. Government. Uh, we do plan to have an episode on uh, industry collaboration efforts in foundations and 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 joint platforms yeah, in the future. So uh, I look forward to to seeing you all back for that. Alyssa, um, welcome back. And uh, I saw the the contribution uh, that you made on chat. Would you like to? Um, it's particularly, I know from an OpenStreetMap point of view, OpenStreetMap has kind of built itself for the last decade on, on being a shared resource for so many different projects and initiatives. Um, would you like to share what, what, uh, what you've seen in that area? And, uh, and then I will wrap us up. Uh, well, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Um, good. Thank you. I'm not sure what I missed, but um, I, I will say that I, I, I do, I do think, and I have seen that there is a, um, elements of so many elements of open source like development that we that are carried into um other other spaces and environment whether it's um even technical or not um and that does include like you know transparency and uh, of 
of um, of creation, the collaboration, like collaborative, you know, nature, the even the agility. But um, in terms of, I really like the question about, you know, joint ownership. I, I think that um, you, you see more and more so these like public-private um, uh, relationships where there's these, you know, so, these consortiums of um, different government entities and um, you know private um, expertise like coming together to build like um, uh, various degrees of like open data, open uh, open technologies, open resources. Um, they may not all be open, um, and they may be like kind of little little uh, in gray areas of um, of, um, of of purpose. But um, I, I do think that they're, they speak to um, a, a time of, and it, it, they speak to not only a time, but also a, I think a recognition that, you know, there is, there is not in um, uh, citizens' best interest, it's not in like company best interest to um, own things in a siloed space. And that rather, you know, there is, this um, kind of need to to collaboratively share and you know back to open source collective collaboratively support um, uh, like software technology development. So um, I think I think and maybe I'm overly hopeful, but I think I, I'm really impressed with um, and excited for how much um, we have learned from open source development, um, even beyond like the the software projects that we have, but uh, it's really, I think has shifted the way we work um, and, you know, and work with one another. So yeah, I'll maybe end with that. Um, so I'd like to thank you both for uh, for joining me today. I'd like to thank the Red Hat developer team for hosting us for the first three episodes of this. From next week, we'll be on a different uh, Crowdcast channel, uh, so watch out for that. Um, our next episode is the evolution of the open source um, nonprofit, which is uh, we will be joined by Karen Sandler from the Software Freedom Conservancy and Rich Bowen, a uh, former board member of the Apache Foundation. Uh, to discuss how, and Stephen Wally will be curating that discussion to discuss how um, the open source nonprofits have evolved from, say, 20 years ago, where you had single project nonprofits like the GNOME Foundation, Python Software Foundation, to the modern um, open source nonprofit and uh, how their their role has evolved in terms of enabling collaboration across across industries. Uh, so I look forward to seeing you all for that. And um, this video will be going to YouTube. Uh, it, it's actually been live streaming to YouTube if I if I did this right. Uh, thank you both. For, <laughs> thank you both for joining me. I think I think this was a fascinating discussion, and I look forward to seeing you all at future editions. Thanks, Dave, so much. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye. Pleasure. Thanks, Bye.